you're going to have family, you're going to have work, but you need, if you're going to sustain yourself in this kind of high intensity work, you need a third thing. And it doesn't matter if it's, you know, ballroom dancing or dart throwing or bowling, who cares? It's that you're in a different community with no pressure where you can think about one thing and there's a win and a loss and it's done that evening and nobody takes anything home and it fills you with joy. That's what you need. You need some outlet for joy and for it to de-stress a little bit. And without that, it tends to, though, you get wrapped around your axle a little bit. Hi, folks. I'm Dan Dworkis, and this is the Emergency Mind Podcast, a space where we bring together lessons from the emergency department and beyond about performance when it matters the most and applying knowledge under pressure. Our guest this episode is Dr. Preston Klein, who is the co-founder, principal, and director of research at the Mission Critical Teams Institute. The MCTI is a global collaboration of groups spanning emergency medicine, urban and wildland firefighting, tactical law enforcement, and military special operations that come together to work on the unique problems faced by mission-critical teams, which they define as small groups of integrated, indigenously trained and educated experts that leverage tools and technology to solve complex adaptive problems in immersive environments lasting five minutes or less, where the consequences of failure can be absolutely catastrophic. Now, obviously, this definition applies to resuscitation teams and specifically code blue teams within the emergency department, but there's an enormous amount of crossover between what Preston and his team does at the Mission Critical Teams Institute and what we do here at the Emergency Mind, which is part of why I'm so excited to have Preston on the podcast with us today. In this episode, we're going to talk a lot about the day one problem. We talk about the foundations of operating from a human system and ultimately about bringing humanity into the middle of a crisis. Preston is an absolute treasure trove of knowledge on performance under pressure, and I learn an enormous amount every time we get to sit down together. If you want to learn more about what they're doing at the Mission Critical Teams Institute, you can find them at missioncti.com. That's M-I-S-S-I-O-N-C-T-I dot com. If you're just joining us for the first time on the Emergency Mind podcast, don't forget to check out our book. It's called The Emergency Mind, Wiring Your Brain for Performance Under Pressure, and you can find out more about it at emergencymind.com slash book. Okay, all that said, let's jump into this episode. I hope you enjoy. Preston, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, man. It's an absolute honor to talk to you. I, I am just absolutely awed by what you guys are doing at the Mission Critical Teams Institute, and I'm, I'm thrilled to have you today. Thank you very much for having, having me. I've been a fan of your work for some time now, and so it's exciting to get to get to do this talk. For folks that don't know you or don't know the Mission Critical Team Institute, would you mind giving everybody just a quick overview of who you are and what you do? No problem. We were um, founded um, in 2016, and we were incubated at the Wharton School for three years and then went independent in 2018. Um, and our job, quite quite simply, it's it's actually pretty straightforward, is to help um, what are called operators, people that are in fire or emergency medicine or tactical law enforcement or special operations or NASA, go from being operators or people that do the work, right, to becoming instructors, so to teach the next generation. And that leap going from doing the thing to teaching the thing is a big, big dis um, distance. And it, you immediately encounter what's called the tacit knowledge transfer problem, which is, you know what right looks like, but you can't explain it. And the easiest way to understand this in medicine is there's right now somewhere in the world, there is an attending physician who is in a surgical unit, a trauma surgical unit or ER that has to hand the scalpel to the resident for the first time. It's the first time up at bat and they've got to open up a chest of maybe some kid and they can get it wrong. And they've read everything they can read and they've been to all the classes but what does the attending actually say in that moment? What are the words that are actually used to help that person move from theory to application in that moment? And that's the research that we do. And that's what we bring together the best faculty in the world to teach courses um, for folks um, around the world um, who do this work. Hmm. Absolutely amazing. I, that's certainly a, a problem that I've been on both sides of and have been incredibly lucky to get wonderful knowledge transferred to me and then also to to you know, sort of like fight the wonderful struggle of figuring out how to deliver that knowledge to the to the teams that I'm lucky enough to train. Um, how did you get into that? What what got you fascinated in this problem? So I was a wilderness guide when I was a kid out of a kid in trouble out of Detroit. Um, and so I had a judge and a social worker and um, they thought it was they encouraged me uh, quotes air quotes there <laughs> to, to go work at uh, Special Olympics during the summer. I was a 17 year old punk kid, 16 year old. Um, 
And I became really, and then I went on to work at the Ronald McDonald House camp, a camp for kids with cancer or, or terminal diseases. And then um, in the late 80s, um, became a wilderness guide working with kids out of prison. So I'd go out for two months, uh, come back in for two weeks, go back out for two months. So I was doing about 300 days a year in the back country um, about, for about four years. And in that process, all the kids that I were working with were struggling with some terminal problem, whether it was disease or genetics or society, right, or poverty or whatever race. Um, and many of them, um, in the time that I knew them, would end up dying. And I became, at a very early age, really obsessed with this question, why do some people I know make it and some people don't? And this, over time, um, sort of um, morphed into this question of, um, how do we learn how to navigate uncertainty? So what, why do some people make it, some people don't? Why are some people better at this? What are the skills that are actually useful to know so that we can zig and zag through life with a greater likelihood of success and sustainability? And that's over the last 30 years, that's the research that I've been doing um, You know, at Rutgers and Harvard and then Penn, all looking at this question of how do we learn to navigate uncertainty? What are the things that we can do? It's such an interesting way to frame that because it, it's not immediately obvious if you don't work in some of these fields. I think that that handling uncertainty is its own skill, separate yes. from the domain in which you're applying that. And there are certainly domain specific things that you're doing, how which could be any version of how uncertainty presents itself to you regularly or what tools you are sort of given to start with in order to address that uncertainty. But the idea that uncertainty and the approach to uncertainty is its own thing is is sort of a revolutionary idea in a lot of ways. What, what, oh, what's, really ahead. Interesting, yeah. what's really interesting is that there's some research emerging in medicine right now because of COVID around the concept of uncertainty tolerance. And what they're finding is that folks that have low uncertainty tolerance are more likely, or at least is suggested, are more likely to have mental health issues, drug addictions, and also suicide rates. And you have to think about it in these practical terms. Let's say that you choose to be a doctor, right? And you're going to become a doctor or a nurse, but you you like routine, you like regiment, right? So you're going to choose a job as a ward nurse or as a doctor that does the same operation over and over and over again in a scheduled environment, right? And, and you have a, so there's a low medical uncertainty because you kind of know what you're doing. And so you can have some personal uncertainties, right? But, but if you're going to work in, say, trauma, where you're dealing with medical uncertainty all the time, you kind of need some personal certainty, right? You need home life to be a little settled in order to do that. COVID introduced personal and professional uncertainty. So if you already had a kind of a low tolerance for uncertainty, you redlined very quickly. And it was, it was background noise. It wasn't something you actually even saw. It was just that every day was increasingly an anxious because there was more and more things you couldn't control. And for the first time, you were going on deployment. You were going into combat because if you got this disease, you could bring it back to your family and not even know it. So your, your personal life was threatened and your un medical uncertainty was growing. And for some folks, that's, that's just... just um, it's a perfect storm. And so what we're finding is, is that if we can get people in conversations about not only, hey, be aware that there is such a thing as uncertainty. You're not God. God gets a vote. You don't get to control everything. But there are some things you can do to help you manage those sort of anxieties around that. And that's a lot of work that people smarter than me are doing really great work on in terms of mental strength and health and conditioning. Let, let's press on that. So, so what are you all finding, and what are you building out of the out of the MCTI about about teaching people about uncertainty and sort of how to handle that uncertainty? Yeah, some of it is um, you're going to laugh, right? Because it's like eat less and exercise. That is the right answer, but really hard to do for a lot of people, including myself. Um, and so, it, the things that are actually the most useful, like the the, the most squeeze, is drink water. And, and medical folks will, yeah, but then I have to go to the bathroom more. That's a problem. Okay, great. But that's also a choice, right? Because your body doesn't change, right? You need hydration. It's what feeds the brain. Water feeds the brain, right? And it also takes out lactic acid and all these other toxins in your body. Um, eat right, right? Figure out what your, your sugar balance and your rhythms are, right? What are your spiking things? Get some sleep. One of the really interesting research on doctors that has been done multiple times is they will say to doctors, do you think sleep's important? 
and they'll say yes. And they'll say, do you think you're negatively impacted by sleep? Oh, me? No, no, it doesn't actually impact me. I can, I can drive just as well when I'm drunk, right? That's basically the answer, right? So it's a lot of silliness of just like net confirmation bias and some, some blind spots. So sleep is kind of a superpower. Limber mobility, stretching, right? Taking some time to go out, as our friend Andrew Huberman talks about, the neuroscientist, go out and look at the horizon line, right? Go out and just stare at the at the sky. It does actual physiological things for your body being outside that's positive. Um, say hello to people in the hallways and smile at them. It actually has a chemical reaction in your body, like projecting positivity actually works. It's not magic. Um, and then lastly, uh, not lastly, there's a whole list of these things. But the other thing that's really powerful is this idea of having a third thing. And so you're going to have family, you're going to have work, but you need, if you're going to sustain yourself in this kind of high intensity work, you need a third thing. And it doesn't matter if it's, you know, ballroom dancing or dart throwing or bowling, who cares? It's that you're in a different community with no pressure where you can think about one thing and there's a win and a loss and it's done that evening and nobody takes anything home and it fills you with joy. That's what you need. You need some outlet for joy and for it to de-stress a little bit. And without that, it tends to, though, you get wrapped around your axle a little bit. Hmm. It, all those things you just named are, are physical things. It, yeah. it, third thing, a physical thing that you're talking about? A physical thing, it, it's, it, but it's more about the community, right? So it's more about like um, going out with some people who aren't your family and aren't your work and only care that you're the third baseman on a baseball team. So only care that you can catch like and throw. That's all they care about. They don't care that you're a big deal position or that you're your dad. Like you're used to them is a third baseman. And that there's a lot of power to that. Um, the, the physical things really do matter when it comes to sort of processing these sort of mental strength conditioning things. But the other thing is things like breathing, right? So box breathing or Wim Hof breathing is huge. Things like positive self-talk, um, things like visioning, right? Um, things like that really matter. And the science is showing this over and over again. It's so, it's so great hearing you say that. I mean, this is just such sort of like, like almost ancient basic wisdom about how to operate the human system that we're describing here. And, and yeah. the more I dig into doing the emergency mind, like the more the more amazed I am at how deep this direction is and how little I knew about it for so long about being a physician. I haven't been a physician forever, clearly, right? But, but you know, I'm out there doing these decisions. I'm running these teams. I'm teaching the next generation of people. And, and I'm still, you know, getting, it's, it's just humbling and awesome to be struck by like, right, right. I have to drink water in order to deploy, deploy my knowledge. Like, yeah. oh, okay. Like I have to take a deep breath and sleep in order to be able to resuscitate somebody. Like, wow. What, what a basic, like sort of like building block foundational thing to think through and how little that's taught and structured into our formal education about everything, which, which sort of gets to this thing that you and I were talking about in a different context, which is this day one problem. Yeah. I don't know if you want to go into that and define that a little bit. So the background on this problem, and we're going to release this research pretty soon, is um, I was at a federal law enforcement facility where they were teaching brand new agents. Um, and it was the first time the agents would hold a gun. And they were teaching them in a great instructors. And the instructors were like, don't forget to breathe. So I turned to some of my uh, community members and I say, do you teach them how to breathe? And they were like, no. <laughs> and I found that really funny. So I literally went around the world to the most elite teams in the world, sports, military, everything else. And I said, do you teach them how to breathe? And they said, it's complicated. No, we should, <laughs> but it's sort of complicated. And what this led to, and there are some complicated reasons around breathing and its, and its connection to skill development, but overall breathing should be taught. But we asked a different question, which led us to this different question, which was now that you, so for example, Dan, now that you've been doing this work for a while, if you were to go back to day one of your first day in medical school and you were to think, what are some foundational skills I could lay down day one that would, that if I developed them as a practice would make me a better human now, would accelerate my progression now. And we're getting amazing replies from around the world. We're getting breathing, we're getting sleep, we're getting these things, but we're also getting um, the ability to manage grief and death, to mm -hmm. understand that as a human, you don't, doesn't matter how well educated you are, you don't get a pass. 
right? So if somebody dies on your operating table, there is still a process you have to go through. And you don't get a pass because grief has its own rules. And you, you have to submit yourself to those rules and get through it. So you can either ride those waves, right? Or you can drown underneath them. Those are your choices. You don't get to rewire or hack, you know, uh, any of that stuff. So those things, having a learning discipline, um, making sure that you invested in your family because your family knows you the best and as crazy as they are and all families are crazy, they're the people who know you the best and will be there on the bad, bad days. And so those are the kinds of things where we're finding from people who are, you know, several decades in their career, looking back and to your earlier point, are saying some fundamental human things that, that we need to start relooking at the way we build and maintain communities. I'm struck by, by thinking back about um, a previous guest on the podcast, Dr. Emily Brumfield, who's, who's out in Louisiana working and who um, was somebody I was lucky enough to work a lot of my night shifts with when I was coming up in residency. And she said something that's so similar to what you're saying here that, that just struck a chord for me, which is this idea that, that just remember that you're a human and not a robot. Yeah, And that humans come with certain rules attached to them, certain wonderful strengths and certain things that we just have to obey the law of the universe for. And, yeah. and that so much in my early, early um, training, like especially when I was finishing residency and just coming out of residency was about trying to be a, a successful robot, yeah. essentially, like just pretending that I was a robot and just powering through everything I could possibly think of. And that now to approach that from a different stance and to say, okay, well, actually, hey, I, I'm human. I'm a human system. Like, what does that mean? And how do you learn that? And I don't know, I guess maybe that's my primary answer to this day one problem idea, which is that I'd, I'd want to teach myself how to be a better student of myself. Yeah. and to learn and experiment and to sort of see that human system in action. But Dan, it's worth noting that when you talk about, when you reference things that, you know, to take it one step further, when you reference things like vulnerability and humility, right? The ability to be vulnerable and open yourself up to experience where you feel them, it gets coded differently for gender and it gets coded differently mm. for, for culture. And what we found over and over again is that a man being vulnerable can often be seen as a strength, whereas a woman being vulnerable can seem as a weakness. Hmm. And how this sort of um, manifests itself in a community environment, especially a high stakes mission critical team community, there has to be trust and cohesion built in order for those things to manifest or people won't. So there has to be, a, it's not just about you being like, I'm gonna be open to the world. You have to be in a, in a social environment that will allow for it. It doesn't matter what your intentions are. If you, if you decide, hey, I'm going to look after myself, and I'll give you a great example, Dan. So because of the work I've done over the 30 years, the promise I made to myself that I still rigorously uphold is that when I'm sad, I cry, and when I'm happy, I laugh. Now, now I know that sounds like, okay, got it, but think about it for a second. In this world where we lose a child, if I'm impacted by that, I will shed tears in honor of that child, right? I will not do it in the middle of a crisis, obviously, right? There's a time and a place and we have to look after each other. But I'm not going to try to protect my masculinity or protect my brand by showing weakness. I'm actually going to advertise and broadcast the fact that I am both human and that I have sorrow because we've lost this child. And mm -hmm. if you're watching me for cues, you should, and you're sad, you can also be sad. Like I'm validating the fact that I don't care who you are. I don't see you as weak. I see you as human. And so this kind of thing that people don't listen, they watch. It's one of the things that's allowed me to have this 30 year career is that I process my emotions as, a, as quickly as I can. So I can get to the other side. This whole idea of being the robot and stifling it. I I've never seen it go well. Never. I've never once seen it work out in the end. Preston, I, wow, man. I I wish I were better at what you're saying. I, I look forward to to working on that. I think that's a, yeah, I think there's a lot in that. There's a lot. And there's so many layers, right? Because there's the male-female thing, which is enormous. There's also the cultural thing. There's also the status thing. You're a doc. You're the person in charge that everybody else is freaking out, but they're okay because you're okay. 
if you lose it, the whole pipeline gets nervous. Unless you are like the old Italian grandfather who cries when he's sad. And it was like, oh yeah, he's, that's a, he's an old Italian grandfather. He cries when he's sad and he laughs when he's happy. Like he doesn't mean anything by it. He's still going to, you know, he's still going to kick your butt if you're out of, like, that's what, that's what we all need to say. Old Italian grandmother, right? Like you just be human. And people were like, oh no, that's just Preston. He'll be fine in 30 seconds. He just needs to let that out. Wow, man. What, this is this is awesome. This is absolutely awesome. And, and it's like um, uh, Zorba the Greek. Have you ever read that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly like what you're describing in a lot of ways. This like this like depth of humanity and, and not separating, not being scared of that depth of humanity, even as you're in the middle of running a high performance tactical team that's doing a crazy yeah. resuscitation. Yeah. Um, we, uh, that is the, something to aspire to. One of the fascinating phenomenons that have happened a number of times over my career is that because of the unique position I have coming in and out of teams all the time, and people know who I am and they know I'm coming and I'm leaving, invariably, it happens less now, but it still happens. Somebody will walk up to me and say, Preston or Doc, can I talk to you for a second? I'm like, yeah, sure. And remember, I'm an educator. I'm not a psychologist, right? Let's be really clear here. <laughs> My role isn't to come in and counsel people. That's not what I do. But what's interesting in this weird phenomenon, not weird, but it's a phenomenon, people come up, can I tell you a story? And I'm like, yep. And they'll tell me a story about their worst day. And at the end of the story, they'll just stare at me, right? And it's super interesting. And I was like, how can I be of service to you right now? And they're like, do you think I did the right thing? Mm. And I said, you know what? I can't answer that for you, but I can tell you that what you went through was really hard, like really hard. So I'm going to validate that. And secondly, everything you described I can't imagine making a different decision. I won't lie if they did, but they did something atrocious, I'll tell them. But most of the time I'll say, I can't imagine doing anything different. And just that, like having, being able to walk to someone else who has also smelled the smoke in some way in sorrow and just once be able to tell your story and have it heard by somebody who can actually get it without me doing anything I don't even have to say anything. It's just that. And we should all strive to do that for other humans. Just be a recipient of their story, right? Just actually hear them and go, I don't know, but I can hear you. And I can recognize that was impossibly hard. I'm, I'm struck by what you said about that you have to you have to do this in the middle of an environment that supports you for it. Mm -hmm. And so- can we talk about how to build that environment? Yeah. And I guess I'd ask that both as the team leader and also as a member of the team who's not the leader, how do you build those environments in, in these longer standing teams? So here's, we'll do the bad news first, right? The bad news first is that people don't listen, they watch. Like, and I'll say it again, people don't listen, they watch. And so as a leader, if you're engaged in behaviors that you don't want to see in your subordinates, that you're going to be a losing proposition right? You just won't. You can't, you can't treat people poorly and then expect everyone else to treat people nicely. That's not the way that works. Secondly, it's all the stuff you learned in kindergarten, right? Like that Robert Fulbloom book is still true. Say please and thank you, get the door for people, do the, do, you know, as they said in the, in the book Legacy, sweep the sheds, right? Do the dishes, the community dishes and do them without complaint. It's the subtle community building stuff that has the most impact. Now, I'm saying all this, but I'm assuming competence, right? Like when you have this conversation, Dan, we have to assume competence, right? Sure. So I'm saying this among a team of competent people. I'm not addressing when you have somebody who is suboptimal. That's a different sort of, con that's a different conversation that has different sort of color to it. I'm assuming that you have a team of competent people together. One of the things that you can start doing every day is assume, uh, assume competence and professionalism and good intent. Just, just start there. Assume that everybody is the hero of their story or heroine of their story and assume that they are making decisions based on them wanting to do a good job. No one wakes up in the morning and says, boy, I hope I suck today. It never once happens, right? And so if we can assume that right? Then we, we go a long way. But one of the things that we, a big epiphany, and you can, we're going to release this research very soon as well on this concept of critical versus routine communication. And the reason this really matters is because when you ask people, do you, can you tell me what the optimal principles of routine communication is? They'll say, yeah. And they'll say things like, 
active listening and you know respect. And if you say, and a few other things, and, and you say, okay, now tell me the optimal ways of critical communication, 300 seconds or less, someone's gonna die, what are you gonna do? And they'll say things like brevity, flat tone, not emotive, right? All these things. And you say, now, do you, how does your team know when you switch from routine to critical? So if you suddenly be that critical guy that's barking at people because you see a threat they don't see, they're going to code you as jerk, right? They're going to code you as like, why is he, why is Dan yelling at me? You're not yelling. You're being clear in your communication. But that's the subtle gear shifts that the team all has to get dialed into so they can come on the hero's journey with you, right? Too often we're leaving people behind and then everyone's mad at each other because they didn't understand we shifted gears. And so, so you're in that moment, like there needs to be some sort of a, um, a limit crossed and some sort of an announcement of that limit to say, okay, yeah. team, like, here's like, you know, mount up or whatever it is, or let's yeah. go. Um, yeah. This, this threshold, right. This threshold of liminality, mm -hmm. right. We're, we're entering in. So with me or eyes or now or whatever. That's interesting how, how that's not programmed into a lot of what we do in the emergency department at the moment. There are, there are certain circumstances where it is, right? Which is that we see, okay, there's a trauma coming in, ETA, three minutes or whatever, yeah. and we are loose. Everybody is like, they're setting up their gear, they're setting up their positions, they're getting their gloves on, but they're loose. They're joking, they're talking about what they're eating for lunch or whatever it is. And then there's some moment where the patient rounds the corner uh, and somebody, whoever sees the patient first is like, all right, patient's here, let's go. And then yeah. it just shifts and everything just clicks into place like that. But I don't remember ever, I don't remember ever training on that. I don't remember ever talking about that. I don't remember that being a part of what we did on purpose. I think it's something that is taught as part of what's sometimes called the, the hidden curriculum or the implicit yeah. stuff that we do, where we transfer this knowledge in terms of like, nobody tells me to do that. I just watch the people above me do it. And then at some yeah. point it's my turn and I'm like, oh, well, I guess I'll say this now. Um, but I think as a leader, we have to name that stuff as mm -hmm. much as possible. We have to name it, especially the new folks, right? Hey, did you see it? Do you hear that next time or, or afterwards? When you hear that, this is, this is the expectation. One of the really fascinating things that happened now was I've spent some time at NASA and Mission Control with Holly Ridings, the chief flight director. And, you know, you've all seen Mission Control, that big, you know, all those, those consoles. One of the fascinating things is in Mission Control, they're all on headsets. Right, they're all talking to one another on headsets and, and all these other teams around the world. But if you're in mission control and something's happening, like you're maybe you're in charge of electronics and somebody else is in charge of the batteries, right? But let's say that something's happening on yours that affects batteries, you'll notify the room. But if it starts to escalate, you'll physically stand up hmm. and so and you'll turn to the battery person. And when they see you physically standing up and looking at them, they stand up. And it's the way to visually show the room. This has turned into a thing, right? And then everybody locks in like, oh, electrical and batteries having a thing. And that no one ever taught anyone that. And I did a bunch of interviews to try to understand when do you get taught that? They're like, we never get taught that. That's just what you do. Huh. And that's the kind of this tacit knowledge that's fascinating to me about how communities learn together to like emphasize certain things explicitly, but never talk about it. So we can do better in that sense by naming some of these key ingredients that we found to, to perform better and to call them out and to make them explicit and then maybe to make them centers of iteration and experimentation about how to sort of alter them in different ways. 100%. Um, but uh, how do we do that when... So, so something that you guys talk about on on um, your podcast, which was a great episode, was about this idea of swarm teams or X yeah. teams, yeah. where which is a, a group of people that come together, usually from disparate training disciplines. They gather in a particular space and time to accomplish a particular mission, and then often they disband afterwards yeah. in one form or another. And you know, it, in the emergency department, when you run a resuscitation in your resuscitation bay, you know your nurses, you know your team, you know the, the techs and the clerks and everybody involved. But often you're called out of your environment to go upstairs and run a code in some other location. And you might be, it just might be you in a backpack full of gear walking yep. into a room where you know nobody. And that's yep. so these swarm team things really happen in emergency medicine as well. So how do you bridge those two things that we're just talking about? So, so you can say mission control has this culture yep. and some of tacit knowledge is culture. And some yep. of it is, is, is like you said, watching and seeing what more experienced operators do. And so you're going to develop this, 
framework about how to understand when things shift, but then you're going to take that mission control person and you're going to put them down into a completely different environment, maybe even mission control in a different country or something like that. How do they, how do they operate then? And how can we operate then? Yeah. So we've been talking to a lot of resuscitation teams about this actually, because it's come up a lot and we have nicknamed it the first 30 seconds. And so what we've asked uh, medical professionals to do that operate on these tactical swarms that come together who with people, maybe they don't know is you're going to be in some floor, some room somewhere, right? And they're going to, you're going to get a, uh, a buzz and it's going to say, Hey, get to room 403. Right. And um, you're going to meet a team there to do a resuscitation or whatever it is. You might have maybe 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. So that let's just hypothetically say it's 30 seconds. What can you do in that 30 seconds to accelerate your engagement, right? And so the idea being there's a bunch of things you can do, actually. You can take uh, do uh, one or two sets of box breathing. You can grab a sip of water. Um, you, can, um, you can think about what is the first sentence that you're going to say and why does that matter? It matters because human beings are still social, right? And so they want, when you're coming into a new team, they want to know, are you the jerk? Are you funny? Do you talk too much? Do you talk too little? Who are you? Why are you in the room? And especially as a leader, if you can come in and what we found is there's a thing called the surgical cap challenge, which is going around the world. And because of all the PPE that people are wearing, masks, we have to remember that masks have a mythological quality to them, right? And it invokes things deep in us that we don't always understand. And too often, when you come into a room where everyone's masked, you know the people, but you can't remember their name because you're not getting enough cues and there's social anxiety of me going and I'm like oh I know I've worked with Dan but I can't remember his name and that's a distraction so just put your name on your cap like take away that problem why introduce it some teams around the country have gone one step farther is that they've put a, a picture of themselves mm -hmm. on their chest with them smiling. And they've actually shown this has a huge positive impact because it's like, oh, I know Dan and look, he's smiling. He must be happy, even if you're not, because that's what the picture says. Right. And it's that subtle stuff that really, really matters. And it's the kind of thing that when you're coming together fast really matter a lot. Yeah, we, we definitely train on that first sentence in the door, especially because, you know, we'll often respond to a place where there's some efforts already undergoing about resuscitation and, and we need to assess the situation and then rapidly decide if we're going to take command. And yep. then if we are, we're going to take command of a team of people that have never met us and don't know us at all. And there's no history there. There's no sort of like backstory about, oh, I remember that time you did this awesome thing. And so therefore I'm willing to follow you in this weird way. And, and the, the limited, some of the limited training that we get about it tends to revolve around the idea of walking in the room and just asking who's in charge. And then depending on whether or not somebody answers you or not, you usually respond immediately afterwards with, great, I'm in charge. This is what we're going to do. And there's some good to that in the way that you were saying about, about you know, crisis communication, that it's clear, it's to the point, it galvanizes the room around who's in charge. But, but I wonder, as we're having this conversation, like, what can we do better in that one moment? If I walk into a room and I need to take command and I need to, to, to sort of take the helm, what can I be doing better about that? First of all, I, I think this is really fascinating. This has come up with a few times this time, this question of team transition. One of the things is that some teams treat it every time like a surprise. Wait, you're going to take over? Well, of course they're going to, we know that in advance. That's not a surprise. Like, why are you surprised right now? We actually know that's part of the system. And so to actually train, hey, you're going to do an evolution and then you're going to transition. There's going to be um, someone who's receiving and someone who's transmitting, right? And so this idea of how do we do that well? One of the, and, and one of the things I think about all the time, when I worked at the Wharton School, I worked at the Wharton School for 10 years, and um, there was three senior faculty. Senior faculty at the Wharton School are, are legendary, right? They've been there a long time. They've probably won multiple awards. You know, they're famous. They get, they get called by governments, right? And there's these three gentlemen, Richard Schell, um, Howard Conruther, and Dr. Mike Useem, all doctors, all famous. And I was assisting them in a research project. And they were all coming together for the first time. They've known each other for decades, right? These are friends. They've known each other for decades. And I'm coming into a meeting they're having to help them, right? And as I come in the room, all of them, it's almost like being um, at court in England with the queen. Um, it was it was not regimented, but it was courtesy that you only see in the movies. It was 
um, it was first names, Howard, great to see you. Can I get you um, something to drink, right? No, no, let me get you something to drink. Hey, can I get you a chair? Let me get you a chair. And it was all overly courteous, but it was done with, with a seriousness and a gravitas. And later I asked Mike and Dr. Rasim, what was that all about? You guys have known each other forever. And he says, you know, Preston, we live in a world where we have big footsteps. And we have a lot of power and a lot of networks. And sometimes people will watch us interact and they'll infer things that didn't, weren't, wasn't true. And we actually have to do, go out of our way to make sure everybody understands that we genuinely have affection for one another. We genuinely respect one another and we have to be demonstrable about it. And I learned a really important lesson, which is when you're in a high stakes environment, sometimes you actually do have to do a little performative work to demonstrate respect because in the heat of the moment, that's not always true. And what's fascinating when you do interviews with older gray hair, blue hair uh, trauma surgeons and you, you watch them. They're the ones that will say please and thank you. It doesn't matter how chaotic the world is. They're like, I'm making this up because I don't really know, but they'll like scalpel and they'll say thank you. Even though like it's a mess, that level of courtesy, it demonstrates both a calmness, a control, an expertise, and a kindness. And it just takes the, the temperature down in the room, but it also demonstrates leadership in a way that is just powerful to watch. Such a fascinating idea to think through the 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 performative aspect that you said of that about how do we how do we walk into a space and not only bring medical knowledge to that space but bring an infectious sense of calm yeah right like i, I think about this word sang froid a lot you know the yeah. french for cold blooded but performance under pressure and, and i think that one of the most wonderful things about it is that it's it's catching and as you said about the leader like when you whatever tone you set is going to be the base note for that chord that everybody yeah. else is going to hit and so being conscious of that from the very beginning even when you're not the team leader you know you get tasked with something hey you know dworkus do the ultrasound yeah. like yes sir ultrasound like like the the cadence you hit and the way you carry yourself has all these ripples around you like this that that whether or not you're conscious of you're you're exerting and it's an interesting thing to start thinking about how to train that and how to um, how to make that how to make us all better at that because I do yep. think there's oh no go ahead well just to the point right it's all contagious so mm -hmm. calmness is contagious rage is contagious anxiety is contagious but the truth is at the elite teams whether it's FDNY or the Navy SEALs or you guys the truth is you probably don't have people who are screamers that stay very long or are, are successful. It just doesn't work that way. The, the tribe tends to reject them. There tends to be an allergic reaction because it creates too much extra work on everybody's bodies to respond to this person who's losing it. There is a time for yelling, certainly a time for yelling to sort of focus people's thoughts or get people back in the game, whatever, um, under or over arousal, right? Needs to be modulated. But it's, it's done in a very tactical way, not in a reactive way. The bottom line here is that all of it has to be intentional, right? All of it. And so what do you see as best practices around setting that intentionality? I, I mean, is it, you know, obviously, if you could design training from the very beginning, you'd put a lot of these systems and machinery in place from, from day one and you'd teach yeah. people about it. But, but we're working in a system that already has you know, a bunch of existence to it. And yeah. we're recording this today on um, on the 19th, which is actually match day for yeah. all of the residents, right? So there's going to oh, right. be a huge crew of ER residents that I haven't seen the email yet, but we're about to get 20 new ones that are going to start yeah. with us. And, you know, folks, if you're listening to this, I am so psyched to meet you. It's going to be awesome. Uh, and, you know, they're coming from very different training backgrounds. They all come with these different sort of like experiences from medical school based on whatever they did. So we, we can't really redesign the whole system, yeah. but, but what are best practices around setting that intentionality moving forward? And you mentioned one already, which is, I think that people watch, they don't listen, right? So yeah. it's my job to model that behavior on every shift with every patient, especially the ones that carry these huge emotional valences, the resuscitation of children, the really bad trauma, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, but, but what else, what else can I do as, as a team lead that's, or even as a team member who's trying to change, change the process from below that, that really sets that intentionality. 
As part of my doctoral research at the education school, I was lucky enough to spend some time with Dr. Charles Schwab, who um, was um, the famous traumatologist at Penn. Um, and he was helping redesign the trauma unit there. And I got to spend some time with him and Babak Sarani, who's now at George Washington University. And Dr. Schwab, one day I was talking about this same issue about like residents coming in or docs coming in. He says, Preston, here's the thing. He says, for the most part, any mistake they make, I can fix. And mm -hmm. it won't be lovely, but I can do it most of the time. My concern isn't that they make a mistake. My concern is they try to duct tape the mistake. He says, and I'm using my language, not his. He says, what's interesting is that when you watch me, as I'm walking around observing, if if I ask a, a resident, what's your plan? And they don't have an immediate good answer. I'll move them out of the way so I can fix whatever is in front of us. And then I'll bring them back in. And I have no problem with that. We'll have a discussion, but that's learning. That's part of it. Where I'll have the problem is if they fight me. If they say, no, I got this or, oh, or anything, all they need to do is step out of the way. I'll fix it. Then I'll put them back. That's their role. Anything other than that role, expect a very difficult conversation. And so I'm saying that because you've got a bunch of residents coming in that want to prove themselves as they should, but they should actually pick their fights. They should know when it is that it's appropriate to fix, like prove themselves and when it is to be a student and a learner. And that, that ratio will change over time, but there's got to be a trust between the attending and the resident and the, and the nurses and everybody else to understand, hey, look, we're going to let you throttle out until we tell you to throttle back and you have to immediately throttle back. You cannot hesitate because that's where trust is lost. When your ego and pride start to become more important than the patient's like, life, that becomes a real problem and expect to have a really tough conversation. And by the way, those tough conversations really matter. I think that that it's still okay as the leader, if, if somebody decides they're going to do something stupid, to jack them up. Do it quietly, do it privately, but definitely jack them up. I've been jacked up a number of times in my life, and it's changed the way I've done business. There are ways to do it, but there are there is a gravitas which comes, which is that thing you just did, don't ever do it again. I, I want to shift gears for one second. When we first started talking you talked about defining this tacit knowledge problem and, and the way you were describing it was that, that you are the expert and you have um, this knowledge that you developed over time and through personal experience that transcends the textbooks and everything else. Yep. And I'm the learner and you're going to try to figure out how to deliver some of that knowledge to me so that I can take over. And I think we both know that part of it is things you can teach and part of it is things you can't teach, but you can guide me as I'm doing my experiments. Um, but, but there's an interesting sub part of this that occurs in emergency medicine that I wonder if you've run into in other places, which is that sometimes in the emergency medicine world, there are things that are really complicated and really rare. These like ultra halo yeah. events that, that maybe I have never done before. Yeah. And I'm still trying to teach you how to do them and how to guide you into it to be just as prepared as I am for it. Yeah. Right. So when I was, um, when I was, a, I think, a two-day-old intern or something like that, we had a patient that had a really horrific upper GI bleed, and we had to place a Blakemore tube, which is this complicated thing that sort of looks like a dragon. Um, and nobody in the ER had ever done it. Not me, not the senior residents, not the attendings, nobody. And, and it was one of these moments where, okay, so how does that attending teach me how to put in a Blakemore tube having never actually gotten their hands dirty with it either because it's just such a rare thing or, or i think about for myself you know i i've been knock on any wood i can find nearby fortunate enough to never have had to perform a perimortem c-section which is one of the more rare and challenging procedures we might do as an emergency physician operating in rural environments but my residents when they leave my training need to be just as prepared as I am to do that technique that I've maybe never done personally. Have you run into something similar to that in some of the other teams? Yeah, I wanna, I kept, I wanna decouple a couple of things in your question, right? Mm -hmm, and so absolutely. when we talk about tacit knowledge, tacit knowledge is a lot of, um, you know how to ride a bike, but you can't explain it to me. You're gonna say, get on and pedal. After 200 years and a billion bikes, that's the best we can do right now. And it has to do with the complexity of all the movements and um, proprioception and all these other things. Um, so that's tacit knowledge. 
what you're talking about is um, encountering what we would call a critical event. And so our language is this, there's routine, contingency, and critical. Contingency actually falls within routine. So routine is you're making the donuts, but you can tell ahead of time, hey, this is where we may go off, off the, the wheels might come off. So let's come up with a contingency plan. And then if the wheels come off, then we just, we pivot to the contingency plan, but we've already predicted it. So it's still routine, just a different path. Critical is, man, this is the zombie apocalypse. We have never seen this before, right? What we know about critical environments is in those environments, what the good teams will do is they'll announce them. Hey, folks, we're no longer contingency. We're now in critical. We're moving into chaotic event or uncertain events. At this point, I need to marshal the team. So, hey, everybody, um, that I used to be in charge. I'm still in charge, right? But we're going to be much more collaborative right now. That I'm going to I'm going to say out loud all the things I'm thinking about and doing. You now need to own this problem with me. You need to engage and lean forward. Everybody needs to be looking at this besides me. You can be asking questions, and when I can answer, I will. But we're going to do this together because I need all of our brains trying to solve this problem, not just mine. And what that, the reason that matters, Dan, is because as the zombie apocalypse events happen, and they'll happen with more frequency, you need to condition people to know that when that call goes up, they got to switch gears from, oh, I just have my little role, my little lane, to, oh, now I'm on a swarm looking at a novel problem set that I have to contribute some solutions to. And that's a very different mindset. It's going to be exhausting, um, but it's it's the best way to solve a novel problem set, which is to increase the cognitive diversity against the problem set. And the way you do that is you crowdsource it among experts, not like you don't call your mom, right? Sorry, mom, if you're listening to this, I have on my desk over here right next to me, the uh, Sources of Power by Gary yeah. Klein, like the, yeah. you know, one of the, just a master work about this idea about recognition, prime decision-making. And, yep. and it strikes me that part of what you're saying requires a deep and wide enough knowledge base to recognize as early as potentially possible when something is going outside of my experience. Yeah. And to recognize that that which again goes back to this idea of this like this liminality and this sort of like boundary condition about things. Yeah. Um and I think if you look at the research about failed airways, for instance, in emergency providers or even anesthesia providers, a lot of the problem comes, the problem doesn't come in because you can't access surgical front of the neck access. The problem comes in because you don't recognize the situation where all of a sudden you're in a can't intubate, can't oxygenate event, that you've yeah. crossed that threshold and you've moved from routine or contingency or even third or fourth backup plan into essentially a new universe that you have to really align yourself with. Um, I was just emailing the other day with Lawrence Gonzalez, who wrote the book, Deep Survival, yeah. an incredibly wonderful book. Uh, and he talks a lot about that in, in there as well. This idea that when survivors transition from their normal state to a survival state, essentially when they add that survivor's mind, it's all about recognizing that like, you know, you're in a new universe that you weren't in before. And that recognition is such a powerful piece of this puzzle. Yeah. I, it is really powerful. And um, both those names that you mentioned, um, Gary Klein and Lawrence Gonzalez are really amazing. And the what I would just say is that that same research that you're talking about when I've looked at it, um, not only in medicine, but other fields. Um, so you're so there you are, right? You're you're doing your job and you're an expert and you're the recognized expert and the authority in the room. And part of that is you're in a confidence competence loop, right? You're competent so that you're confident, right? And all of a sudden you encounter a novel situation where you actually don't know. And you're this dawning awareness, oh gosh, I don't know. I'm not competent in this. And now I'm going to start to lose my confidence. And now I'm worried other people are going to see this. So the social dynamics come in play, right? And what ends up happening is that there's this spiral of shame and embarrassment that prevent you from actually looking at alternative solutions and planes have fallen out of the sky because of this. This is what led to the crew resource management research that came out aviation now used everywhere. So this is why for me, it's so important to both name it and then immediately crowdsource it. I'm still in charge. I'm still the authority. I still make the final decision, but folks, we're going into new waters right now. Like this is novel for me. I'm telling you this now so that you know that. I'm still going to move forward. I'm going to do the best I can. But what I need you all is engaged in the problem with me. Hmm. Because you got you got to find a way to get out of that shame embarrassment cycle. You got to name it and get past it or it will destroy you. And we've seen it over and over again. The thing I would want to just tell all the medical workers right now 
um, is if you haven't heard about our work on residue, um, I would just encourage all of you that we have been living in really different times, uncertain times, and you are all doing extraordinary things. And one of the things you probably haven't been doing as much is looking after yourself. But I can tell you that the country needs you and they need you here now and five years from now and 10 years from now. And so I would just ask for you to do some things like get some sleep when you can, drink some water, go out in the woods, get a hobby, be nice to people, allow people to be nice to you. Like you got to start looking after yourself because the truth is when we're in trouble, we call you, but there's no one you can call, not often. And so you've got to take responsibility for looking after yourself. You're not as alone as you think sometimes. There's a lot of people out there that want to help you. You just got to let them know they can't read your minds. So just let's everybody look after one another. That's the only only last thing I really want to say to the medical audience, which is um, I, I want to help all of you, but you have to be breathing for me to do that. Um, and so like, let's just look after one another. That is phenomenal. Preston, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's a, it's a total joy and an honor. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. All right, folks, that brings us to the end of this episode. I hope you learned something and I hope you enjoyed. Again, you can find out more about both the Emergency Mind and the EM Basic podcasts, uh, either through Apple Podcasts or anything else, or by going to embasic.org or emergencymind.com. As one final reminder, our goal here is to provide education, and what we talk about should not be construed as medical advice. Additionally, it represents our own opinions, and not necessarily those of our employers or the hospitals with which we work. Okay, good luck out there. Keep training.